Um, I'm really happy to be here with you, and, but I have a huge challenge, a huge challenge as this event is going on. We have great speakers, and I'm wondering what new I'm going to tell you. A lot of things that I wanted to tell you, a lot of people have told you. So I will try to bring a perspective of what we at the United Nations Environment Program are, are, are thinking about all these concepts that we have heard about uh, create share value, about circular economy, about recycling, about uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, I will start with you talking a little bit about the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. We have heard yesterday Tamar talking about these ambitious goals that governments have agreed to see how they can fix major challenges in the, in the society today, mainly the crisis of environmental crisis, the social crisis, and the economic crisis. So the 2015 was a turning point in all international negotiations. Why? Because governments have made several agreements that will shape what will happen in the next 15 years to come. Um, there are key messages from these agreements, and I'm going to talk about the four that could be and will be game changers in, in, in the way that the industry will need to behave. So the first one is the Sendai framework. It is an outcome document that came from the third disaster risk reduction conference. And it says that business have to have a facilitating role in preventing and monitoring disaster risk reductions. So if your company is performing in an area that can have risks to the society, you have to prevent and you have to monitor your risks. Um, then we have done um, an agreement that is called Addis Ababa Action Agenda. This agenda uh, that was uh, developed um, in the third conference on finance and development was talking that private sector have to um, look for new ways of investing, but also looking at development and dissemination of technology. COP21 was done after Addis Ababa because that framed what much countries, how much the official development assistance will put in terms of money and resources to implement all those frameworks. At COP21, there was this ambitious agreement that requires a deep rethinking of existing practices. It was saying that businesses should not only look at inside their walls, they should and to look at the value chain, the impact that they have in society, and that we have to change our mindset. Leaders of today should and should look at long-term investments and, and change the mindset of this organization um, businesses and change the business models. The SDGs with the 17 goal and 169 targets will require solutions that have not been placed. We had many other agreements, we had Agenda 21, but the scale of ambition that is required to achieve this goal is unprecedented. So we have to create a way to measure against indicators and to find a star, a north star, where we are going to see what and where we want to achieve. The 169 targets that include energy efficiency, water reduction, um, poverty alleviation, 
all of them are integrated. We cannot, as a company, in the day of today, to pick two or three sustainable development goals and follow those. So there is a need for an integrative approach. But what does it mean? How these SDGs will impact? So yesterday I was talking to the Ministry of Production and that have informed, the, have informed me that the country will decide how they are going to invest to create regulations, how they are going to support the industry to achieve some of those targets. So it, it will change the way that in some countries like Costa Rica, for instance, that decided to be carbon neutral, companies have to follow. They cannot do that in the isolation. So partnerships is a central piece that it's important for all um, developments that will happen in industry. Uh, companies have to involve consumers, have to involve suppliers, have to involve the entire value chain in decision making, in trying to find these new models. I, I have worked with Gunther 17 years ago, and yesterday I was telling to him, but you are telling the same that you have told in the last 17 years. And I think the biggest problem is that people are not hearing the messages. And, and the messages is that time is passing fast. And if we don't take care of the resources that we have today with different business models, we will not get out of this crisis. So um, some of business models have already changed. So we have heard today about sharing economy, Uber, Airbnb, um, about fair trade developments, but also technology. Knowing that technology on itself cannot curb the emissions of CO2, cannot reduce uh, many times um, some of the use of the resources, but innovative solutions is required. Among of the biggest challenges that we have from business that we have here from them in terms of how we are going to cope with this new agenda, how we are going to implement it. The first one is accountability and transparency in communication. You probably know the guidelines that exist already, GRI, Integrated Reporting Framework. Um, we have heard more this morning about uh, other tools like Future Feed. All of them will be essential for increasing accountability and transparency in communication of, of businesses. The problem that is the quality of sustainability re reporting that we have today, it's very poor. The quantity of companies that do report, it's very low. So we have to increase the number of reports and they have to report on the right indicators. So we have done a research with 150 companies uh, worldwide that do report on sustainability. And in this, we have found that only few percentage of these companies report on CO2. Then energy, water, waste, and materials. No other indicators are main streamlined in sustainability reporting. So this has to be changed. Then we need to talk about this integrated system thinking that uh, Gunther uh, uh, spoke so much yesterday. We have heard this morning about uh, circular economy and we have to find solutions. And there are tools, life cycle assessment and eco innovation, looking also at the triple bottom line that uh, do exist and that I will talk to you a little bit later. Um, the requirement of uh, working with inclusive value chains. When we talk about value chains, a lot of people do not understand the difference between supply chain and value chain. I will get to it a little bit further, but it means that all, all companies and business that also support you to increase the value of the company. Um, 
one of the things that is very interesting is that we have tools that help you to, to focus on where are the most important hotspots in an industry. So there is footprinting, and, and these, these, uh, these tools, uh, which I will talk a little bit later, um, will frame uh, what is innovation could be supporting. Um, Multi-stakeholder partnerships, as I mentioned before, partnerships are essential, and capabilities and resources. We do not change business models if we don't have resource. In some cases, resource means brain trust. It means um, creative ideas, but in some cases, it means money. It means new technologies. So this brings me to what we are doing at UNEP. To demonstrate the value and feasibility of eco-innovation, UNEP has developed a project that is financed by the European Commission to work on a holistic approach uh, that is a methodology that helps small and medium enterprises in eight countries. In total, there are 56 companies because Coca-Cola, Disney, MC Johnson, and other companies that we have heard, they have sustainability departments in there. So they know how to, to, to do and to improve sustainability, but these small businesses. So that is what we are trying to work with them, uh, trying to bring concepts in their business strategies, in their business models, in their operation, how they could rethink their operations. To do that, we have developed a series of, of materials. One of them is a manual. It's called Business Case for Equinovation. It was uh, developed in partnership with several um, academics. It's a free for download, and it's also available in Spanish. So if you are interested, please let me know, and I will send all the links to all of you. So this project um, that aims to mainstream innovation in, in small business enterprise, they look at the three pillars of sustainability. So eco-innovation, as many of you may think, it's not only the green part of it. It also relates to the social, how, how um, the companies are working with uh, uh, their employees, how they are working with society. It also takes the life cycle thinking. So take into consideration where are the key hotspots that you have in a company. We are looking at the business strategy and model, not changing only a product, but also changing the entire model and looking at value chain cooperation. Uh, so here is, 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 is a slide that we put together to explain people on most of what companies are doing. So companies are mostly looking at supply chain, the logistics. So looking at the products, how much I can reduce in terms of producing my plastic water bottle, um, how much money I can save, uh, what, which processes I can improve, and how can I, di I, can, I can disseminate this product better, uh, distribute this product better. When we take the life cycle approach, we see how consumers use this product. We look at the waste, we look at the value and economic and the economic and social value of, of, of its operation. It also relates to finance, to re, re, uh, legal frameworks. So when we were doing this manual, there are two things that we're looking at, the value to business and the value to society. So the first behavior that we have seen in companies is that most of them were thinking around the edges, singular interventions to improve processes and products. And this system change requires rethinking to mainstream sustainability through business operation across the value chains. 
I'm going to tell you about a case study, the case study of Natura. And it's not because I, get, I got a hand cream for free or because I had a makeup session that I'm talking about them. I'm talking about them because it's one of the cases that was uh, collected in our business case. And Natura has transformed the way that they innovate and they look at market differentiation and sustainability as a competitive edge. So how they have done it? They have done a continuous research, new technologies, new trends, and looking very carefully of what was expected from their clients, from their suppliers. They selected um, suppliers on a shadow price. So shadow price is not only the real price, what it costs to the company, but also how much it costs to society and environment. This is an information that is provided by the organization some years ago, but uh, the company states that they have saved 750,000 in their operations and the use of resources and optimized process through selecting high-performance sustainability per, uh, suppliers. The creation of partnerships to build a higher added value. So working with communities. Yesterday, we have heard some of the activities that uh, Natura does to this end. And a life cycle approach. So a calculator is used with indicators on the entire process of development of a product and they looked at a simplified packaging for all sold products. So a specific product that they created is called So. So this is like a normal shampoo. They created a new design that used 70% less of plastics, that lowers 60% on emissions, and create innovative um, formulations of their products. They are using a lot of natural ingredients, etc. But what it was really interesting is that people think that sustainable is more expensive. In this case, Natura made it possible to have a very attractive retail price, which make a new consumer segment. Most of the people that buy this product do not know that this product is sustainable. So, but this is an embedded activity of the business model that shows how eco-innovation could be implemented. But Natura, it's a big company. It has 6,800 employees and 1.5 million consultants selling this and annual sales of three million. So they have the resource for that. Which is more difficult when you hire a company in Colombia with only eight employees. So that is one of our interventions in the Eco Innovation Project. So this company is a hot, deep, galvanizing um, company, meaning that uh, it's a process of coating iron and steel with a layer of zinc to impede that the metals get corrosion. So these products, they are very much used in the construction, transport, um, the, the transport infrastructure, bridges, etc. So the original strategy of the company is that they had zinc as raw material. So it was purely from mining, non-renewable materials, in, with a lot of impacts on wastewater. Um, they had the servers of, on galvanizing, which they sold to products. There was a lot of problems in terms of zinc loss during the process. It was a high intense energy consumption um, as a process. There were risks of using chemicals with employees and limits uh, of profit due to limit capacity. So 
We went to this company through the support of services providers, which basically is the National Cleaner Production Center at Colombia. So we do not work alone. We do not implement projects. We work with associations that can do that at country level. Um, we brought all the company uh, departments. We brought uh, the entire value chain. We brought uh, representatives from the consumers. We, and we started doing an eco-innovation process to try to develop a new model for this organization. As conclusion of this, this uh, brainstorming and assessment, we have developed a new model. They are still working with hop galvanizing service, but they discovered that they could create a new line of service to clean some chemicals that exist in this, to try to recover some of those chemicals as well. So this new service line basically cleans the solution, the, deep, the pickling solution that you deep the zinc to be used by other SMEs. So instead of only doing galvanization now, they are going to help companies on how they can improve their performance and be more environmentally friendly. We also have developed a new technical support. So they have realized that most of the galvanizing service, it was a limit duration of, let's say, 20 years. So they created a new system that now they could increase the lifetime of this galvanizing process. As a result of, of, of the eco-innovation process, they have created two services that didn't exist before. They have reduced um, uh, the, the zinc consumption as a raw material. They are recycling zinc because they are cleaning the, the, the pickling solution to recover some of the zinc. They are also looking at um, reduced chemicals, so the, the, the employees, uh, they are in a health, healthier environment. They have reduced uh, emissions because their processes consume less and they have increased profits. But one of the things that it's more interesting is that they created jobs, jobs that didn't exist before. So this show how we should be rethinking our business models. It can be created in a metal sector, it can be created in uh, the agri-food sector. It just requires some um, partnerships, some engagement of the value chain to make businesses in a different way. So I would just uh, close this with one, uh, one slide that I really like. So it says that, no importa cuantos recursos tienen, se no sabes como usarlos, este nunca será suficiente. Este es portuñola. <laughs> so, but I think every uh, so the resources have really to be um, uh, taken care of, and um, we count on you that you will going to bring all these ideas that you have heard today to implement them. And if you have any doubts on eco innovation processes, I have I'm here to talk to you later. Thank you very much. <laughs>